Here attendees of Introduction to Neurodiversity as a framework for understanding autism and exploring the possibilities for change. It has been brought to my attention by a conference participant that M. Beggs and Jim Sinclair both do not identify with the pronouns she and he. Regretfully, as my knowledge of their identities was outdated, I misgendered each of them multiple times during the presentation. I am sincerely apologetic to them, their families, and any member of the community that I may have inadvertently offended. This is a matter that is very important and personally dear to me. Please be assured that this misgendering was accidental and caused by my lack of accurate information, not in any way done in malice. All erroneous materials have been updated. Thank you to the conference participant for letting me know, and thank you all for understanding. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming to the workshop this afternoon. Um, today, we will do a very brief introduction into the paradigm of neurodiversity and how it operates as a framework for understanding autism, um, as well as exploring this, this uh, perspective as it relates to pushing the narrative for disability, disability rights, inclusion, and accessibility forward. Um, today, as we go through the presentation, it is going to be simultaneously translated. So for those of you following me in English, I will pause at the end of each slide just to give time for the translator to do his translation, and uh, then we'll move on to the next slide. So I just wanted to give you a sort of an orientation um, to myself and to this work. So I work as a researcher for Chris Besh. CRISPESH stands for the Center for Research for the Inclusion of Persons with Disability. And so at CRISPESH, our focus is on pushing conversations, the programs and the policies surrounding disability toward ever increasing inclusion, accessibility, and empowerment. Um, it's our purpose to examine all sorts of different perspectives that shape the lives of persons with disabilities and to incorporate new and innovative knowledge into our various practices. So as a disability researcher, I hope to share with you today how the existing models of disability have and continue to contribute to our understanding of autism, how autistic people have explained the impact of these models, um, as well as to consider how this newly emerging neurodiversity perspective um, offers a unique and incredibly valuable perspective from which we can shape um, positive, empowered inclusion moving forward. So <clears throat> I hope to show the potential of this perspective and to also uh, sort of take a moment to look at how under neurodiversity, both medical model and social models of disability, um, elements of those models can both still exist and still offer information and support to people with disabilities. Um, <clears throat> as well as how neuro neurodiversity can provide a lens for the formation of a significant shift in policy, in scientific research, in portrayal of autism in the media, and indeed in day-to-day -day life. Um, I would like to just say of neurodiversity is such a broad perspective. It could easily be examined as a social justice movement or a human rights mo movement, um, but we simply don't have time in a 45 minute presentation to to really see it for all, all, of, all of the way that it impacts and all of the potential ways that it can impact. Um, so without further ado, okay, so very quickly, um, we will go through some of the current models of disability. We'll highlight the strengths and the challenges as was presented um, by various autistic self-advocates. Um, we will then focus on neurodiversity how it is a unique and in integrated independent perspective. Um, following this, we will examine um, the language choices, particularly systemic language that can impact and form how autistic people and neurologic, neurotypical people view autism. We're gonna look quickly at the history of the diagnosis of autism, um, as well as the messaging and the logo that we see often in the media, as well as to have a look at the evolution of the spectrum with a particular view to identifying some of the ableist messaging that is embedded within these, um, which then in turn forms unconscious bias. Finally, 
we'll, we will summarize some of the employable techniques that we touched on in the conference um, for moving forward favorably as researchers, as professionals, and as advocates working within the field of autism. So throughout the, the presentation, I do my best to embrace uh, the language that is proposed by uh, neuro, neurodiversity, by this movement. And um, okay, so the first model that we'll just touch on very, very quickly is the medical model of disability. So the medical model of disability focuses on providing support to people who are living in a situation of disability by addressing the physiological differences that create pain, struggle, or barriers to their health or their psychosocial development. Generally, research and practice under the medical model focus on the biological differences that are shared by a group of people. This is what creates a diagnosis. The medical model highlights how differences create deficits, pathology, or delay in achieving normal developmental milestones. The underlying goal of the medical model is most often rehabilitation or curing individuals and assisting them to achieve developmental milestones along a trajectory that is as close to statistically normal as possible. Under the medical model, the goal is to first identify the disability as a distinctive feature of a person's body or mind caused by genetics, disease, trauma, or other health conditions. The next step is to identify the required medical care provided in the form of individual or group treatments, which are administered by professionals. From this perspective, disability is a problem that needs correction. According to the medical model, <laughs> medical model advocates, groups of individuals with specific conditions, they require specific supports treatments or programs. And this is so they can achieve their own optimal development. And to, to deprive them of this by disregarding difference is detrimental to their development. So autistic people have described being the focus of the medical model as a very negative experience, um, as it often places exclusive emphasis on the in how the individual person is abnormal or deficient and failing to meet societal norms. The medical model focuses entirely on how to fix what is wrong with the autistic person from an outside perspective, either through medications, through treatments, therapies, or behavior modification. Even if these differences do not cause impairment effects, such as pain or discomfort or illness to the autistic person, Instead, focusing on what the autistic individual, um, instead of focusing on what the autistic individual's needs are, the medical model does not require professionals to give thought about how the environment affects the individual or their development, and the ultimate goal is to alter the individual to better adhere to normative development trajectories, and thereby to fit into the various environments that are already set up around the autistic person. So the social model of disability, conversely, focuses on providing support to people living in a situation of disability by addressing the obstacles or the barriers to social and professional inclusion that people with disabilities face every day. The social model of disability, in fact, emerged in response to the medical model when people with disabilities and their families began a movement of advocacy fighting against the abuses suffered by people with conditions of difference. Social model advocates explain that by focusing exclusively on difference as deficit, be it biological, developmental, or physical, the medical model tends to disempower, isolate, and stigmatize groups mm -hmm. of people with differences, leaving them vulnerable to discrimination, abuse, and loss of rights. So social model advocates believe that it is proven time and time again that the benefits of the medical model do not outweigh the costs of such an approach and that the best thing for support professionals to focus on in offering support to people with disabilities is what can be changed in the environment, not in the person. So many people believe that the benefits of reshaping homes or workplaces or recreational venues to make space for a diversity of people 
will ultimately outweigh the benefits of treating deficit or impairment. Within the social model, there is a productive place within society for all people. All people are able to make decisions for themselves regarding their care, and they should never have treatments imposed upon them. Instead, it is the job of society to negate the impairments, the impairment effects of autism. Contrary to the medical model, the social model regards autism like all conditions as a set of impairments that's caused by an unaccommodating society and environment and imposed upon the individual. While this might outwardly seem like the answer to the downfalls of the medical model, viewing all disability as solely the product of an unaccommodating environment, it doesn't acknowledge true realities for autistic people and self-advocates. The first is that under the social model, the autistic person is misunderstood because there is a lack of vocabulary or perspective to understand the specific neurological diversity or differences. The second way that the social model was found failing for autistic self-advocates is that some impairment effects will persist regardless of the environment and the individual may need or want or seek out personal treatments to resolve these impairment effects. So as it relates to autism, unfortunately, the social model tends to regard caregivers, even autistic individuals who are seeking treatment as sort of searching for the wrong solution. Um, and there is no place within the social model to acknowledge that impairment effects can be so profound as to render the individual incapable of independent working, critical life cho choices or safe daily living. So where do we go from here? How do we resolve these really distinctly different yet influences, influential approaches to disability and autism? Each has their own inherent strengths and weaknesses as they pertain to the development of the autistic individual. In the following slides, I'll first introduce some concepts from the neurodiversity perspective that echo the positive elements of the medical and social models of disability, as well as present foundational concepts of neurodiversity that are quite unique. From the perspective of neurodiversity, disability or illness paradigms can be replaced with diversity perspective. This does, not lose, this does not lose important aspects from other perspectives as it takes into account both strengths and weaknesses and contributes to the idea that variation among people is positive in and of itself. So what is the neurodiversity movement? From here on in, I'm going to try my best to give you a very brief introduction to a very complex um, paradigm. Um, it's, I love this paradigm. I find it endlessly fascinating. It is continually evolving and more and more people from more and more fields are beginning to join in um, and contribute to the development of this perspective. However, it is very complex, but I'm going to do my best to just give you a brief introduction and hopefully, um, hopefully strong foundational elements of the paradigm will, will be um, represented. So, Neurodiversity is the belief that some people are born with brains that process the world differently. Within neurodiversity, there are two types of people, neurotypical, who encompass the majority of the population, and neurodivergent, consisting of people of various cognitively differenced conditions. So I will take a moment to mention that under the umbrella of neurodiversity, um, many different uh, groups are beginning to align themselves. So there is research regarding ADHD and neurodiversity, dyslexia and neurodiversity, um, schizophrenia and neurodiversity, bipolar and neurodiversity. So there are many different groups of, of people who are finding, um, I guess, alignment and knowledge under the neurodiversity umbrella, as well as empowerment. Um, but again, just within the, the limitations of our time today, we are going to speak about autism specifically. So neurodivergent individuals learn and have thought processes that are atypical, so different from neurotypical, but that does not mean that they are dysfunctional. So just from this very basic definition, we can see that there is elements of the medical model in there. For example, to say that what defines 
um, what defines neurodiversity is also the inclusion of neurotypical development. So you both must understand the normal developmental trajectories as well as atypical trajectories. Um, both of those things are very important to this uh, perspective. Um, it aligns with strength-based approaches where it says that individuals with autism must be encouraged to follow their own unique trajectories. And it also falls under the social model where um, normative trajectories are not superior to atypical trajectories, but both are considered equally valuable to a society. So the neurodiversity movement postulates that the autistic brain functions as nature intended. Uh, Gian, if you could just go back one slide. Thank you. Um, and that cognitive deviations are in fact normal. And in certain environments, there can be advantages or disadvantages to having this type of neurology. And that is also true of the neurotypical brain. So neurodiversity suggests that this variation among neurocognition is normal. It is a variation, it is distinctly different, but that it also it has its benefits as well as its drawbacks in the same way that neurotypical development has benefits and drawbacks. So there is no right or wrong type of brain. There is no right or wrong style of neurocognitive function. And perhaps what is extremely unique to this perspective, as far as anything that I have read, is that the neurotypical movement pushes against um, sort of the field of psychology, psychiatry, in as much as it's saying that this field lacks validity um, <clears throat> and that it is actually subject to extreme bias, which reflects the cultural prejudices. And in doing so, it oppresses people who are labeled. So we'll touch on this a little bit more. Um, as we go through the workshop. So neurodiversity also acknowledges that the environments that people live in and the attitudes of the society in which autistic people live in must also be adapted. So in this way, very much in line with the social model um, and that these environments must be adapted to include the needs of the neurodivergent and simply to allow for the existence of the neurodivergent. Um, but it also does not exclude that some individuals, uh, you can go back one slide, Gian, may want some amount of adaption or treatment to cope with personally unwanted impairment effects. So central to this idea is that as much as possible, the individuals themselves must be allowed to identify what their needs are. For example, a person may be sensitive to sound, they may choose to wear noise canceling devices while in uh, auditorily stimulating environments. Um, some may seek out techniques in order to interact with neurotypical people as a way to cope with impairment effects that they find undesirable. So neurodiversity assumes that people with the lived experience of autism and other conditions of neurodivergence, they are the experts on this topic and they must uh, choose which, in which way that they will walk this path. So Critics of the neurodiversity movement typically could be medical professionals or often caregivers of nonverbal autistic children claim that to say all cognition that is significantly different or divergent from normal cognition is disabling. So the neurodiversity movement in fact responds that in cases where the neurotypical person cannot communicate with the autistic person, in these cases, it is because the neurotypical person lacks the cognitive ability to be able to understand the language of the neurodivergent. So this is one example of the way that this perspective is so different from many others. And in fact, um, autistic self-advocates have gotten together to say, neurotypical people are very rigid and they will not try to communicate with us in the language, in the communication patterns and styles that we naturally um, produce. 
So there's also the message that if the message that was being communicated by the neurodiverse person was just understood by the neurotypical person, then ultimately they would not be so dismissive of the value that the autistic individual possesses and the value of the processes that their brain um, presents in communicating this message. We're going to pause here um, just for a moment to watch a short clip from the video In My Language by M. Beggs, a nonverbal autistic adult who describes themselves as someone who would probably be dismissed as many by unthinking, were they not in an environment where they had the necessary technology to communicate so that neuro people, neurotypical people could understand. The video itself is almost 10 minutes long, so we don't have time to watch it all. However, I highly recommend that everyone take the time to watch it uh, later when you can. The previous part of this video was in my native language. Many people have assumed that when I talk about this being my language, that means that each part of the video must have a particular symbolic message within it designed for the human mind to interpret. But my language is not about designing words or even visual symbols for people to interpret. It is about being in a constant conversation with every aspect of my environment, reacting physically to all parts of my surroundings. In this part of the video, the water doesn't symbolize anything. I am just interacting with the water as the water interacts with me. Far from being purposeless, the way that I move is in a going response to what is around me. Ironically, the way that I move when responding to everything around me is described as being in a world of my own, whereas if I interact with a much more limited set of responses and only react to a much more limited part of my surroundings, people claim that I am opening up to true interaction with the world. They judge my existence, awareness, and personhood on which of a tiny and limited part of the world I appear to be reacting to. The way I naturally think and respond to things looks and feels so different from standard concepts or even visualization that some people do not consider it thought at all, but it is a way of thinking in its own right. However the thinking of people like me is only taken seriously if we learn your language, no matter how we previously thought or interacted. As you heard I can sing along to what is around me. It is only when I type something in your language that you refer to me as having communication. I smell things. I listen to things. I feel things. I taste things. I look at things. It is not enough to look and listen and taste and smell and feel. I have to do those to the right things, 
such as look at books and fail to do them to the wrong things. For else people doubt that I am a thinking being, and since their definition of thought defines their definition of personhood so ridiculously much, they doubt that I am a real person as well. So again, I would really uh, strongly recommend everybody to watch the whole video. It's extremely uh, informing and just filled with excellent knowledge. Where does the concept of neurodiversity come from? From autistic people. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, Jim Sinclair, Donna Williams, and Kathy Listener Grant began a push for autistic self-advocacy. Drawing from the disability mantra, not about us without us, they began a movement to shift perspectives, treatments, language, and diagnostic criteria. They emphasized the importance of a move away from cure-oriented thinking. In one of the first articles about the budding neurodiversity movement, Don't Mourn for Us, Jim Sinclair appeals to parents for change. After being denied as a presenter at a major American psychological conference, Jim Sinclair did present this paper at the 1993 International Conference on Autism in Toronto. Jim explains, autism is a way of being. It is not possible to separate the person from the autism. Therefore, when parents say, I wish my child did not have autism, what they're really saying is, I wish the autistic child I have did not exist, and I had a different, non-autistic child instead. Read that again. This is what we hear when you mourn over our existence. This is what we hear when you pray for a cure. This is what we know when you tell us of your fondest hopes and dreams for us, that your greatest wish is that one day we will cease to be and strangers you can love will move in behind our faces. For their own sake and for the sake of their children, I urge parents to make radical changes in their perceptions of what autism means. So very shortly after Jim Sinclair gave his <clears throat> talk, uh, released his paper, I should say, um, Judy Singer, who is an Australian, uh, autistic Australian sociologist, um, began to think, and she wanted very much to coin a phrase or to present a phrase or a word that would span across and that would be accessible to scientists, that would be accessible to psychologists, that would be accessible to doctors, and also accessible to autistic people and neurodivergent people as a whole. And so in her 1998 honors thesis, the odd people in, short version, um, Judy first coined this term neurodiversity. So in fact, it didn't take off right away and she left academia for a little while. Um, and the, the, she felt that the um, resistance to this was so, um, so heavy and so profound, um, but it was out there and eventually it started to, to pick up momentum and people started to be more and more interested in exploring what this really meant. Um, and so Judy explains, she says, for me, the key significance of the autism spectrum lies in its call for an anticipation of a politics of neurological diversity, or what I want to call neurodiversity. The neurologically different represent a new addition to the familiar political categories of class, gender, race, and will augment the insights of the social model of disability. So uh, I think with her unique perspective, she was able to coin this term that was very accessible across many different realms of, of existence. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. So within this model of thinking, why is the language that we use so important? Well, um, as Judy Singer began this path and so articulately put it, proponents of neurodiversity explain, the words that we use to describe a person, whether we intend to speak directly to that person or not, it shapes how other people view that person without their input. The words we choose to label a person will become theirs without their consent, often becoming entwined with their own self-opinion and their own sense of self-worth. 
Therefore, it is very problematic if the words we choose are degrading, excluding, or deficit-focused, because language forms opinion. It therefore also ultimately shapes policy, treatment, and action. So the current systemic language toward autism is strongly founded in the medical model and is therefore often very deficit-based toward neurodivergent individuals and very heavily pro-neurotypical. Systemic language helps shape our critical thought processes and guides language choice within the media, within scientific research, and within policymaking. Autism has been referred to with such terms as the autism epidemic, even though for something to be an epidemic, it must also be an infectious disease, which autism is not. When policy and decisions are being made by people who believe autism is a spreading disease that must be stopped, rather than a divergence of cognitive processing within a normal deviation of human cognition, the motivations of policymakers will rarely line up with the needs expressed by the self-advocates within the autistic community. The systemic language of research and ac academic publications are embedded with ableist messaging and thought processes, which autistic self-advocates within the fields of science, re research, and academics are working tirelessly to change. So if you want to read the slide here, early in the neurodiversity movement, something that was extremely clever, I thought, <laughs> that the autistic self-advocates were doing were to take neurotypical language or neurotypical definitions or neurotypical diagnoses and to flip them. So they took a very critical language to this language that was being applied to them and flipped it. So it would then be applied to neurotypical people. So they could sort of begin to have a sense of what it felt like to be at the receiving end of this language. And they also began to put a very critical lens on what we accept as normal and ask why. Why is this accepted as normal? Why is normal better? Should normal be better? So here we have a quick clip of, again, it's, it's really listed right on the YouTube video. This is a parody. This is meant to be satire, but it's meant to highlight a point. So we'll have a quick look. I read social significance into absolutely everything. I demand that others engage in uninteresting, unimportant small talk. My eye contact is so good. It's unsettling. If any of these symptoms sound familiar, you or a loved one may be struggling with NTS, Neurotypical Syndrome. syndrome. Neurotypical Syndrome affects roughly 58 out of 59 children worldwide. Neurotypical Syndrome is incurable, pervasive, and may be apparent in infants as young as three months old. Additional symptoms include Failing to recognize when sensory stimuli are too high or too low. Engaging in excessive touch, eye contact, smell, and sound levels, and expecting non-neurotypicals to do the same. They adhere to apparently inflexible, non-functional routines or rituals, such as wearing a tie, high heels, or other uncomfortable clothing. I heard straight from the horse's mouth that you should be sleeping in dog's line, but instead, I am putting my foot in my mouth. Idioms that literally make no sense. If you know someone with NTS, don't give up. There is hope. Despite their challenges, with early intervention, many NTS have learned to compensate for their disabilities and to interact normally with an autistic person or specialized interest. I have NTS. I have NTS. I have NTS. And I'm okay. And I'm okay. And I'm not playing the full deck. This has been a public service announcement brought to you by the Institute for the Study of the Neurologically Typical. Okay. So that 
uh, that is one foundational principle in neurodiversity, and that is to question what is normal, what is accepted as normal, and why that is preferred or um, given precedence over atypical. I just noticed that we're really short on time, so we're going to skip this slide and go to the next slide. So I wanted to very quickly bring attention to a researcher here in Montreal, uh, Laurent Montrand, who is um, an active autism researcher. He also has um, an autistic co-researcher in his lab, as well as some autistic research assistants and students. And we're really running short on time, but I find that the, uh, the way that um, Laura Motron explains his perspective is very empowering and very much falls under neurodiversity. So in his research, he is striving to, at the same time, identify those very distinguishable and very distinct characteristics of neurological development of autism. Um, but to push his field and to push the bias or the ableism within his field um, to report on strengths within this profile, as well as areas of challenge. So while that sounds perhaps uh, like it would be intuitive, in fact, in the field, it isn't always. And so um, with his um, autistic uh, co-researcher, co uh, Michelle Dawson, um, this lab produces very interesting contributions to the field by uh, highlighting the distinct strengths um, that are present in the autistic developmental trajectory profile using the psychiatric tests or the psychological tests that are available. And just while slide 34 is getting there, <laughs> here we'll see um, the new logo for autism. Now it happens to be autism month, so it's very fitting that we will um, that we will emphasize the new logo for autism. That is, uh, that's it, Jian, you got it. That's uh, in line with the neurodiversity paradigm. And so the rainbow infinity sign. This is the sign for the logo for neurodiversity, and um, this is to represent both neurodivergent and neurotypical people in an infinity loop. To represent that all people are. Um, important, equal, relevant, present, and that this creates the rainbow of diversity. Um, that is our neurology, that is our, our society. And the autism logo, which is newly developed as well, is a golden infinity loop. And just as a little point, um, AU is gold on the periodic table, so they chose gold for their infinity loop. So they chose the infinity loop to encompass those same principles of neurodiversity and um, then the gold for autism specifically. Um, I guess that's all we have time for. So if anyone has any questions, I'd have, I would strongly uh, uh, encourage you to have a peek at the PowerPoint because there's just lots of sections that we just didn't have time for, but they're super important as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Shannon. That was a really interesting <laughs> presentation. And we can now stop sharing the PowerPoint maybe, and we will not now proceed to a question and answer period of about the 10 minutes. So if you have any question, you can either write it directly in the chat or raise your hand. And um, yeah, so since uh, we talked a lot, we will only have 10 minutes. So please uh, be uh, um, how brief in your intervention, uh, please. Uh, so here's uh, Joël Coriolan. Uh, oui, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, je voulais simplement dire un grand, un grand bravo à Shana. Euh, étant donné que la, la description qu'elle qu a faite, c'était très touchant parce que la description, euh, dites-le moi hein, si vous voulez me parler, faites-moi signe parce que je dois fermer les yeux. Euh, euh, la description qu'elle a faite, c'est comme si c'était point pour point, euh, en tout cas je vais parler pour moi en tant que personne autiste, puis mes enfants, c'est ça, c'est vraiment ça. Euh, En début de semaine, j'avais un, 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 un rôle en tant qu'ambassadrice par rapport au mois de l'autisme. Et c'est tellement particulier que 
ce que j'ai dit euh, lundi que Mme McInnes euh, l'ait répété. Alors, je trouve ça extrêmement euh, touchant et éprouvant parce que là, ça, c'est qu'est-ce que moi, comment que je le vis tous les jours, mais là, c'était aussi par rapport à des recherches. Alors, c'était très... Euh, je ne sais pas quoi dire de plus. Super, c'est très apprécié. Merci beaucoup. Euh, Est-ce que Shannon voulait réagir à cette intervention? Sinon, on peut passer à la prochaine question. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, it's definitely a topic that is so uh, near and dear to my heart and in my family. And so, um, yeah, I just strongly recommend that everybody check, take, take the PowerPoint, check the last slide. There's references, read up on it. It's, it's just so fasc fascinating and there's endless ways to think about this and to push yourself and to push what You know, to me, oh, I love it. Let's let's figure out what is normal. Why or why do we prefer this? Why is this getting, you know, why is this getting preference? Why are we pushing this? And how can we move forward? How can we evolve? Love it. So thank you so much. Thank you. So next question would be, uh, could you talk about the language that should be used to talk about autism? Yes. Uh, I don't know, Gian, if you could share your slide for one more second to slide 32. If you can't, it's okay. But if you can, it'll just help my very brief explanation. I should let you know there's quite a fight going on at the moment between uh, who's defining this language. So the autistic self-advocates and the proponents of this neurodiversity paradigm are pushing very hard for identity first language. So they're saying, don't call me a person with autism. I'm not a person with autism. You cannot take that autism and put it anywhere else. It is distinctly part of who I am, how I think, how I process, what could be more fundamental to my identity than the way that I think and process information. And so then the very, very lucrative uh, billion dollar sort of industry, it's a $2 billion industry, the industry of autism treatment, by the way, $2 billion in the United States alone. That's not even worldwide, a very lucrative industry. Um, they're not enjoying this push. They're not enjoying this push towards neurodiversity. So I took a clip here out of the Autism Speaks um, language, uh, language Guide, which by and large has many good points. It's, it, they're really massaging their message now at Autism Speaks. To, uh, to really stop talking about cures, to stop talking about um, curing autism out of people and removing autism from people and fighting autism. Um, but they do still say, don't say neurodiversity. Instead of that, say this, and this is why. So you can see that still within this big organization, Autism Speaks, which many self-advocates say doesn't speak for me, And that is the most, I would say, common thing that I've seen in my informal research on the internet is that advocates are saying Autism Speaks does not speak for me. Um, they are still saying, don't say neurodiversity. Um, and so I essentially in the language area to go with identity first, to replace, if you see a phrase that has autism in it or a person with autism, replace it with gender, a person with femaleness, families that, families with female children struggle to keep up with the needs of these children or replace it with a culture. And in when you begin to do this little game, you'll see how much of the language is deficit-based, is very um, negative and derogatory, essentially towards um, autistic people. Now, I must say, culturally, neurodiversity has not gotten to every culture. So culturally, some advocates may still be pushing for person-first language because they're dealing with things like, oh, look at the autistic over there doing that. And that, that more um, discriminatory use of calling people by their disability name or by their condition name. Um, and so in cultures like that, they still may prefer person-first language. So again, to be sensitive, if it's a person from a different culture, you're not sure, it's always fine to ask. So how do you prefer that I talk about 
this with you or how do you prefer and just let people tell you so it's not universal neurodiversity hasn't um, it doesn't appeal to everybody not every autistic person will say yes I, I I really feel neurodiversity represents my perspective they don't um but it's always best to ask but I would say that just generally speaking um identity first language so autistic person versus person with autism um would be respectful of this this new um, paradigm and but always to 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 ask and then in in the context of this deficit based and this medical language that often equates people to problems or deficits or deviant um if you replace it with a cultural group and you feel uncomfortable or a gender and you feel uncomfortable then just reword until you feel comfortable until you feel like this is respectful and this is said properly Thank you. So um, maybe we have some time for one last question. Is there anyone? Okay. I don't see uh, anyone having questions. So maybe we can uh, conclude now and uh, stop the recording of the meeting. Thank you, uh, Shannon. Thank you for every, uh, to everybody for being here with us today. Um, however, um, Shannon is available for a short, more informal Q&A for those who are interested for like maybe 10 or 15 more minutes. This won't be uh, recorded, so uh, we will allow everybody to unmute themselves. Uh, so thank you. And uh, don't uh, hesitate to register or write to us for our next event too. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for being here.